I got to tell you, I do a lot of public speaking all over the world. I've done it for about 15 years, given literally uh, thousands of talks, always with PowerPoint. Um, so I got to thank uh, Politics and Prose for denying me that capacity tonight <laughs> and for making me do something I've never done in my entire public career. So, Barbara, thank you for outing me as a middle aged man. <laughs> And uh, I won't take it personally. First, I'd like to thank Politics and Prose for hosting me here tonight. Throughout my writing career, I've been described as a pronounced optimist, which I got to tell you is a distinct niche market, both in these times and definitely in this town. I want to spend tonight sharing some of that optimism about the future, but looking ahead always necessitates a certain amount of looking back as well. So. I want to spend a few minutes exploring the amazing uh, historical arc that animates my book, a story that begins with 13 colonies, quite improbably, and ends with a world-spanning phenomenon we now call globalization. We are at a point in history where America's status as the world's sole uh, superpower is being radically redefined by the emergence of numerous great powers. Some experts interpret the situation as the onset of a post-American world. I interpret it as America's greatest success. The expansion of an American-inspired international liberal trade order to encompass the near entirety of this planet. The point here is that these great powers are emerging within a distinctly American world, a world of states uniting, economies integrating, networks proliferating, state-based wars disappearing, transactions of all kinds skyrocketing, religions competing, and most importantly, a world in which zero-sum defense yields to a future of non-zero-sum security. This flat world is neither accident nor providence. It's so damn competitive merely because we don't know how to build it any other way. In this world we find no strangers, just younger versions of ourselves who are prone to all the same sins and manias we once suffered. How can I make such a statement? These United States, I emphasize these United States, not the European Union, constitute the world's oldest and most successful multinational political and economic and security union. For now, emphasize for now, 50 members strong. Everything we had to do to create this amazing globalization in miniature, all the rules, institutions, regulations, laws, systems of governance, the middle class ideology, all of it, all of it pertains to globalization as a whole and what it is experiencing today. So much so that I like to say that everything I needed to know about globalization I learned in American history. All the good, all the bad, all the absolutely ugly. We have done it all. We didn't so much as invent globalization as merely pioneered its more just and fair form. States uniting so that individuals could pursue their happiness, not kings, not colonizing empires, not ruling parties or castes. Our international liberal trade order, for a long time known as the West, and now known as globalization, replaced the corrupt, unjust, and exploitative colonial world order maintained by Eurasian powers over the previous several centuries. A world order that finally self-destructed in a massive civil war that ran from 1914 to 1949. And when that West, created and protected and nurtured by American power and wealth, grew so wealthy itself that by 1980 a mere fraction of the world's population controlled two-thirds of its productive power, it finally attracted the attention of the socialist East, leading Deng Xiaoping, new leader of post Mao China, to decide that the Middle Kingdom would both marketize itself and join the world for the first time in half a millennia. When Deng made that most fateful decision, he turned America's international liberal trade order into a truly global affair, giving globalization its critical mass and yielding the inescapable reality we face today. Globalization is no longer a national choice, but a global condition. With merely a bottom billion or so still left out of this global economy, noses pressed to the glass. And for those who insist on deriding this globalization as mere storefront of American imperialism, let me note that this is the first so-called empire in the history of mankind that both enriches and empowers individuals. In fact, that's part of our problem, the super-empowered individual. 
Yes, today we are experiencing the first true test of globalization staying power, the first truly global recession, and the first truly globalized economy. We find these prospects quite frightening, and we should, because we have no good precedents upon which to fall back and retreat, and yet we have more history to call upon than we may realize. So let me offer you a different perspective one that animates the entirety of my book. I ask you to focus not on the global affairs of the late 19th century, as so many experts do today, but direct your attention instead to American history of that same time period. Some background first. This historical journey that I describe in Great Powers encompasses two great arcs. The first consists of the creation, transformation, and taming of these United States from 1776 to the start of the 20th century. The second arc describes that model's subsequent projection upon the global landscape, beginning with the administration of Theodore Roosevelt, whose presidency marks the great tipping point between America the national system and America the global model. And here I'll dive into the text for an excerpt, page 78. In the first arc, we'll see an American system proposed by our revolution and increasingly imposed across the continent's wilderness, tested by the scourge of civil war and transformed by the process of frontier integration, and then finally shamed by its cruel excesses and tamed by a progressive spirit that marked our true flowering as a nation, once to find this United States proposed with utmost sincerity a similar solution for the world as a whole, defensively imposing such structure on part of it only after a period of unprecedented global strife. Then to have that model immediately tested by its ideological opposite, the Soviet's empire of force. Meeting that challenge, and better yet, ultimately co-opting it, the American system of states found its historic moment at the end of the Cold War. This end of the Old War's history saw the exuberant resumption of the New World's destiny, a source code for freedom's viral advance around the planet. Even as that code remains largely uncracked by today's grand strategists and unarticulated by a succession of post-Cold War presidents. But just as assuredly, the tsunami of integration that is globalization generated many new forms of upheaval and even more forms of local modification, triggering great unease in its modern originator and protective Leviathan. Why? Because this United States failed to recognize its own history in these integrating processes, these states uniting. And thus, in its fears and in its impatience, began to describe the emerging system it had unleashed as unmanageable and chaotic, constituting a threat to our future. And when that threat was made manifest on 9-11, our search for a new destiny began, albeit one Im immediately and instinctively defined in the most selfish and zero-sum terms, securing the homeland from the chaos of globalization's many untamed frontiers. To their credit, other poles in the system, the EU, Russia, China, India, Brazil, have since stood up to balance our mania, and it is now our challenge to realign our sense of historical purpose with their mix of needs and knowledge, for in our combined assets we locate more than enough resources to master the global challenges that lie ahead. Our American system, tested and transformed by the Cold War into a global platform that we now share with the world, subsequently enters into the same shaming and taming period that once marked our own graduation from nearly unsalvageable union to rising world power. Only this time the stakes are not merely our nation's health, but the survival of the world. Having successfully replicated the economic construct of our American system among the vast majority of the world's population, we are now faced with the long-term challenge of replicating its political constructs, its laws, its institutions, its culture, its associated freedoms of religion, speech, and leadership choice, not merely within nations, but across the international system as a whole, meaning our leadership is far from assured.